Okay, this is a great question from Jake. Um, he asked, uh, Dear Jason, can you please go into the real estate market and why you think housing prices will remain high or, or possibly even go up? I understand uh, having low mortgage rates will become very valuable in the coming year and inventory may remain low because people do not want to sell. However, if assets crash and we enter into a recession, there will be a significant portion of the population who can no longer afford the mortgage. Now, that'll be forcing them to liquidate their real estate assets. Now, has there ever been a recession in history where U.S. housing continued to climb in price? At some point, people who want to purchase a home uh, have already done so in the past two years. How can demand remain high if affordability goes down, wages saving and net worth goes down along with living expenses going up? The sentiment just does not seem likely. Can you can you please elaborate? And uh, also not sure if you have seen the 18 year housing cycle. I'm sure Jason, this is like, you're going to you answer these in your sleep. According to this cycle, 2024 will be uh, the year housing crashes. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, so uh, Jake's got a couple of uh, charts here. He's got a chart that's showing the 18 year property cycle. So it kind of gradually goes up over 14 years and reaches a peak and then takes about four years to hit a bottom after it crashes and then starts the recovery process. And, uh, and then he's got another chart here that just basically shows, you know, uh, in, this looks like interest rates as a function of housing prices. And as interest rates go up, obviously your uh, purchasing power goes down. So your ability to purchase a home, um, you, you can't buy those McMansions, you know, you can at one, 1%, but you know, at 10%, it's a little bit more difficult with, uh, with your spending money. Anyway, um, what do you say, Jason? How are we looking uh, over the next couple of years with with inventories, with people's ability to purchase, especially if we're going into this kind of stagflationary environment where where prices are going up, but uh, you know wages aren't. Good question. Good question. And you know, I have heard this kind of rationale so many times over the last eighteen years of doing this, and it's just funny. I don't know what it's called. Maybe a psychologist would. But it's just a funny part of human nature how people sort of box in the thinking like this. For mm. example, like, okay, we go into recession. So people won't be able to afford a home. Well, what does that mean? It, it, they act as though the home is like this fixed thing, like mm. a home, like they're all the same, like they're all the same price or being able to rent it, like all the places you rent are the same or the same price. Yeah, no, yeah. what will happen is they simply give up their standard of living. That's what declines. So it would be like, and I, I had these great slides I just made up and shared them yesterday on a different live stream where I was a guest. You mm -hmm. know, it was an example of a property in Jacksonville, Florida, that was a million dollars and a property in New York City that was a million dollars. And so what happens is it would be like moving from the million dollar home in Jacksonville to the million dollar home in New York City. Okay, in Jacksonville, you had like 6,000 square feet or something. In yeah, New York City, point. you had just over 600 square feet. Yeah. Okay, it was the same million dollars, right? So it's the same, like if you had the same income, it's just what do you get for the income? It's just that's what inflation is, right? Mm -hmm. It's like moving from a, a, a low cost city to a high cost city. And that's what happens. The standard of living declines. That's it. That's it. People still rent some house or buy some house. They just don't have the one they used to have. Yep, it was yep. nicer. So the, uh, the $1,800 single family home in York, Pennsylvania now becomes an apartment. <laughs> you know, you have to move out and yeah. you have to go to maybe an apartment or something. That place. Right. So you've got you this, know, this or a trailer $1,800 a month apartment that it might also be in York, Pennsylvania. It's not like you actually moved. Right. right but the, right. the dollar value moved around you. Right? That's right. And, and stagflation hit. And so then you're living in a, a crappy little two bedroom, one bath apartment built in the sixties mm -hmm. versus yeah. a newer house there was a single family with a yard and a two car garage and all that other stuff. Right. So that's what happens. That's what gives the mm -hmm. standard of living is what gives. Yeah. Okay. It, it's not anything else. Okay. You know, people just notch down the economic ladder. Yep. That's all that happens. I've, I've seen Maybe. it happen several times throughout my career. 
And much like like the first housing crisis we had in 2008, which ended up in you know, collapsing around 2012, right? You know, that was a different situation where a lot of folks who just didn't weren't really necessarily qualified to own those properties. Right. Um, totally different. Yeah. And, and so that actually opened up a glutton of inventory. I remember as a kid growing up in the Antelope Valley in, in the you know, a high desert, of Cal- you know, California, man, there was just houses everywhere, mm-hmm. vacant houses everywhere. And that was because of those, those uh, turbo loans and stuff, those things that just, those robo loans were, were yeah. you know, and, uh, and this is a different scenario, right? Now it's just uh, the, the, the prices of housing and, and the, they're not building as many, many houses anymore because of the cost of them because of inflation. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, remember sense. what I presented at, at RCL, it was inventory, showing mm-hmm. that we basically need to see a three to 500% increase in inventory just to get normal. Yeah, not going to happen. Okay, so how many homes do you have to build and how much demand has to fall off for inventory to increase that much, right? Mm-hmm. And that's only to be normal, normal kind of market, right? To have an excess of inventory where we're really in a housing recession, you know, you would have to go up to six to eight times at least the amount of inventory we have now. Mm-hmm. So a six to 800% increase in inventory. Okay, then we got a problem. Now, you know, I think the coast is pretty clear barring World War III or, or something else crazy like that, a pandemic. Oh, we have that. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think for the next couple of years, I think we're looking pretty strong in the housing market. You know, and I wish it would cool off. I, I do not like this type of market. It's yeah, it's gotta be hard for for a guy like you, um, yeah, who's whose businesses. Tough. Yeah, totally, totally makes sense. Okay, cool. Let's move on to the next one here. This one's from Eric. Eric asks, Hey Jason, when evaluating a property, what do you consider a good cash on cash return? What do you consider a good total return on investment? And when calculating your total return on investment, would you be more cautious if the number was driven by the property price appreciation assumptions? Do you factor in pr- price appreciation? Yeah, like 5% or 6% Just a year. Just right? 6%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's all we allow our local market specialists to put on those performance. You know, that's that's sort of the national average over a long time. In a linear uh, But of course, there are better years like last year where you could do 17 to 22%. Yeah. You know? But what, what was that part of that question at the end? Say that again. I can't. Uh, yeah. So, when evaluating a property, what do you consider a good cash on cash return? Yeah. We'll start there. That. Okay. So, so cash on cash. You know, right now those have been compressed dramatically. Okay. Cap rate compression, cash on cash compression, all of that stuff in this market. So, right now, you know, if you got anywhere, and depending on the quality of property and the quality of the area, if you mm-hmm. got from you know, six to 8% cash on cash, you'd be doing pretty good. Okay. You might only get 3% cash on cash, Mm. but still you could make a fortune because the properties are appreciating so quickly. But again, appreciation will not last forever. Okay. There will be a correction at some point. Who knows when that's anybody's guess, but just note the inventory as the, if the inventory rises a lot, and remember, it's got to be between three and five times increase to get yeah. normal. So, you know, when you start hearing these media reports, which I'm sure you will at some point, inventory is increasing. What are we going to do? Well, compared to what? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I guess it would have to be a really devastating uh, jobs market. Like the right. economy would yeah. have to get so bad. People would have to get so desperate that they and have to get their And we've got the complete opposite of that right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What do you consider a good total return on investment? That's okay. So, a, so yeah. pr- to answer that one question though, before, okay. Uh-huh. So in our performance, if you look at jasonhartman.com and you go to the properties page, you'll see these performance that lay out all the numbers for you. Mm-hmm. And we only allow them to put a maximum of 6% appreciation projection in there. Okay. And that's pretty darn reliable over time. Some years you're going to give some of that back. Some years you're going to gain more. But averaging it out, you know, call it 6%, mm-hmm. I think you're, you're pretty safe. And then an overall return on investment, you still, those overall return on investments are still looking pretty hardy, okay? 20 to 25% overall return. Remember, income property is a multidimensional asset class, so you mm-hmm. earn your return in many different ways. If it's precious metals or cryptocurrencies, the whole game is buy low, sell high. That's, That's right. it. Yeah. That's the whole strategy. It's all there, right? If it's stocks, 
and they don't pay dividends, buy low, sell high. If they pay dividends, buy low, sell high, get some dividends in between, right? Mm -hmm. You know, these are pretty simple. Multidimensional is real estate. And that's why those returns really aren't that high. If you know how to do the math and you know that income property is the most historically proven asset class in the entire world, and we all know many, many people, if not the person looking in the mirror, who have become very rich with income property. So it works. 